Welcome back to the overnight edition of From Day One. The seat part, of course. Art Bell is with us with John Dvorak. And we were just talking about trying to use animals to detect an earthquake. Okay, so really, when, when you boil everything you've set down, uh, there is we just don't understand earthquakes. We don't understand them to the point that we can uh, predict them at all. Fair? Uh, that's right. And we don't even know if the physics of our large earthquakes even, even permit it. For example, sci scientists talk about something being non-deterministic mm -hmm. or, 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 it is, or it is determined. For example, the orbit of the moon is determined. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you when, when an eclipse is going to happen. All that is deterministic. Earthquakes seem to be non-deterministic, which means we may not have any hope of predicting them. I know That's they, just they, the they, physics of it. Right. They've set up lasers looking across mountain ranges and looked for movement, and they've done all these different things, and so you just can't predict. Uh, it's, it certainly isn't possible today. All right, uh, sort of then on to volcanoes. I, I do have a fear of Yellowstone. Yellowstone, um, I've seen predictions of what would happen if Yellowstone blew up. And uh, they're, they're not good at all. Well, let me say, I've never met a volcano I didn't like. Even yellow, um, Yellowstone? I, I find them intriguing. Um, the ones at Yellowstone with the boiling pots, the geysers. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. All of, and and even looking at, at the debris from the the last major eruptions, all of that, all that is very spectacular. That said, if Yellowstone, if the caldera, boom, blew up, um, what would happen? <laughs> well, um, the main effect, of course, is the tremendous amount of ash. Yes. Which will go, um. I don't recall exactly what the maps are, but some, if you're within 50 miles or so, you'll probably have three to four feet of ash. Mm. And even as far as New York, you'll probably have something like a tenth of an inch of ash. Uh, that will certainly raise havoc to transportation and, and, uh, uh, and the pro and, and the farmland and so forth, the economy. Um, but such a thing is extremely unlikely. Good. <laughs> Honestly, good. Now, again, I've got a lot of Northwest listeners, and of course, you know, they're very concerned about Mount St. Helens with good reason. Right, I was at Mount St. Helens in 1980. You were there? Oh, yes. Oh, my. That, that's, when I, that's when I started my career. I couldn't, I couldn't believe my, my, my great fortune. Uh, well, from our perspective, I understand your statement. Most people would go, oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> Great fortune. Well, it, the the eruption was spectacular, and the dealing with putting in instruments, uh, uh, standing on the ground as it shakes like jello, um, <laughs> and and just to just to be, well, the, the one that I was close to was not St. Helens. It was one down in Indonesia, just less than a mile away when it blew up, and and that was the the. Uh, um, the night that my life changed. It was an epiphany to me when I was just within a mile or two of, uh, of this volcano exploding. And I had just been in the crater a couple hours earlier. It, yes. it, it was a spectacular sight. You had just been in the crater? Yes, we had just gone in the crater. This was Galunga. <laughs> I doubt if people remember the, that it, when it exploded in 1982. Uh, we were actually at the top of a volcano called Merapi, 50 miles away, during its first explosion. Right. And then we, we got in Land Rovers, and we rushed over there as fast as we could. You and do, we were, you do we realize you're, you're, you're describing things with a sort of a, a I, I don't know, a zealous excitement about how cool it is. Most things that people would move away from, run from. So it's kind well, of interesting to listen to. I understand if, it. If you could, could promise me one thing. Yes, sir. Don't tell my mother. Yeah. Okay? 
But have you described these things to your mom? Never. Oh, really? Oh, she said, well, what did you do? I said, well, I had dinner, and, and then we all went to bed. I, I mean, it was just a quiet night, Mom. But anyway. <laughs> all right, we're at a break point, that break point I, I told you about. We'll be right back. We'll be returning to Midnight in the Desert in just a moment. Let's try it again. In that darkest time between dusk and dawn, from the high desert, it's Art Bell's Midnight in the Desert. Now, here's Art. Oh, well, that'll do, I guess. <laughs> ah, electronics. All right, Dr. Dvorak is my guest, and we're talking about calamitous things, actually. And, yeah, I used to chase tornadoes, and I can't tell you the thrill of seeing the sky utterly dark in front of you. Big roll cloud coming. The sun peeking out somewhere, and then suddenly a tornado dips down. Now, even the meteorologists on the Weather Channel have a hard time, uh, Doctor, sort of hiding their relation uh, at, at what they're seeing. This baby is amazing. But then, on the other hand, they have to say, but of course it's awful and very dangerous. Get, get in your basements right now. So, people like us... Uh, it's like riding a fine line, isn't it? Well, that's right. And when you feel in your heart, you're you're very much torn apart because these events are very destructive. Yes. But they're extremely awesome. And uh, if I could tell you, remember there was a uh, earthquake in in Chile about four years ago. I it did. did a huge amount of destruction. I do. And uh, the wave came across the Pacific. And so I went down uh, to Hilo and stood on a cliff to watch the wave come in. Mm -hmm. But deep in my heart, I had this problem. I was intrigued and safe, and I knew there was hundreds of thousands of people suffering, and they were trapped in rubble. Right. And, I, and personally, I, I still have trouble dealing with that between the, the elation I have for nature and and the empathy that I feel for these people. Sure. For example, I asked a person who was the head of the earthquake uh, studies for the, for the United States Geological Survey. I said, the day you retire, are you going to be disappointed there hasn't been a tremendous earthquake like 1906 in California? Right. And he turned to me and he said, no, because of all the suffering it's going to cause. He said, I'm, I'm not sure I could actually deal with that. Uh, and yet that's, the, I guess, the job, um, right? It's a job. I, you, you should be interested in it. It's just hard to temper it uh, so that normal people understand. That's all. Well, that's right. And people who deal with hurricanes, I've talked to them, and, and they feel the same way. There, there's the, this elation that there's a Category 5 monster out there, but they know that in, in 48 hours yes. it's going to rip across uh, and destroy people's lives. Again, my my wife's home in the Philippines uh, is just about the bullseye for more typhoons than you can imagine. It's horrible. Right. In fact, here on this island, there's a there's a tropical storm that's going to become a hurricane tomorrow, oh. and it's projected to run very close to the Hawaiian Islands on Wednesday. Really. And the question is, will it go across the islands or north or south? And um, that's sort of what 
part of life of what you deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, next Thursday, my, my house may or may not be here. <laughs> what, how does it look now? I mean, I'm sure you're following the track very carefully. If the track is accurate, does it miss? Well, it's 1,800 miles away. Oh. And so there's a, there's a huge uncertainty. The only thing that is certain right now is that it's, it's, going, to, it's going to grow from a tropical storm into a hurricane, mm -hmm. Category 2. And it will pass close to, to the Hawaiian Islands at the middle of next week. And the cone, I'm sure, at that distance is well over you right now. Uh, well, the cone includes me. Yes. But it could also be uh, 500 miles north. Mm -hmm. So, but that's, but long ago, I, I, I just learn, you, you, you accept what's given to you in terms of nature. So Mount St. Helens, um, is the fact that it recently, fairly recently exploded, uh, does that indicate to you that it's liable to go again or exact opposite, that it'll go to sleep for a while? Well, um, a system like that can certainly go dormant for hundreds of years. It, it is very unlikely to have a replay of what happened in 1980. Yes. And there's a variety of reasons. Um, and so that's not, if, if you ask people um, who, who are involved in hazards of volcanoes in the Pacific Northwest, Mount St. Helens is there, but the bigger concerns are Shasta, Mount Hood, and Mount Rainier. Oh. Mount Hood... Um, most of the watershed for Mount Hood, that's the water supply for Portland, Oregon. Right. Uh, Mount Rainier, because of the amount of ice on it, could, could, could produce a lot of mud flows. Mm. And, they, and they can reach the, uh, 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 the, the water, you know, in the southern part of Seattle. And there's hundreds of thousands of people live there. And Shasta, Shasta there's not as many people, but it could certainly... Um, produce a lot of destruction. Okay. And so th those are the three which, if you ask about the Pacific Northwest, th those are the ones that people focus on. I see. All right, well, unlike earthquakes, volcanoes, to some degree, I believe, can be predicted. Yes? Uh, yes, because unlike earthquakes, as far as we can tell, earthquakes are spontaneous events. Volcanic eruptions, it's the movement of magma and and it seems that it takes hours to months for it to actually break through. And so a typical eruption, you'll have hours to months of knowing that something something may or may not happen soon. And they'll be clearing people away and that kind of thing. That's right. Unfortunately, there'll be a lot of uncertainty. You're not certain it's going to erupt, and you're not certain exactly um, how large it's going to be. But... But there certainly will be now. Now, now, hours may not be enough to 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 do a lot of things. But but a volcano does not erupt spontaneously. It seemed to me that when Mount St. Helens went, it was a big surprise, and and then after it went, uh, I saw pictures saying, "Well, they should have known because." It, the side of the dome was getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, and it was kind of a big surprise, right? Well, I can tell you what the discussions were okay. of people who were there. It was, how could we have been so stupid? It was so obvious in hindsight what was going to happen. Hmm. But then as we talked about it, they said, okay, let's go back a week. What were we talking about? And it wasn't obvious at the time exactly what was going to go on. And, and there was this constant balance of, of how much do we tell people of potentially how bad it may be right. as to, well, this might happen, but it's a low probability. And then we have this, this uncertainty. This activity could go on for a year mm. without an eruption. And people's homes are there and their jobs are there. Are we really prepared to tell people you 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 are out of work for a year mm -hmm. and it may or may not erupt? And 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 we did spend a lot of time trying to balance that out. Well, yeah. If you tell people a mountain's going to explode, they're going to get really upset, no doubt about it. That's right. But if you say it may not be for a year, 
They say, well, then why, why, why can't I go to work? And yet, you know, apparently, it, it in, might be tomorrow. Yeah, but in hindsight, again, it was obvious, right? In hindsight, it was obvious. That's right. So have we changed since then? In other words, are we making careful measurements uh, that will be apparent to us uh, in, in, in some way other than hindsight in the future? We're making much better measurements. Yay. Um, we have much more out there in terms of finding out about earthquakes, about the ground motion. Um, for example, um, where, where we happen to have instruments, we're able to, to measure the ground if it moves just by a tenth of an inch. Right. Um, and so a great deal has, has happened in the last 35 years. We still understand that it's not perfect, and we're not going to be able to give out, uh, say, next Wednesday at 8 o'clock is going to happen. Right. But we are certainly in a much better situation now than, than we were in 1980. All right. Um, that's a little bit encouraging anyway, um, although I bet there would still be a gigantic fight. Uh, if what we talked about became obvious about whether to actually announce it or, or not. I mean, how do those decisions get made? Well, they they get made after a lot of very heated arguments and name-calling goes on in, in private. Even name-calling? Uh, it, gets, it gets personal. Oh, yes. It really, really gets personal. You mean scientists actually fight with each other? Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> Scientific research is a com is 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 a a a contact sport. <laughs> really? And you better have a helmet on, because things will get things will get very very heavy sometimes. Yes, yes, I suppose so. Um, I don't the know. Those are, are big. Yeah. Sorry about that, folks. Yeah, that's true. And and people are sure they're 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 right and you're wrong. Until so you're proven right or wrong. Uh, that's right. <sighs> okay. Um, so, let me ask you about our Earth um, and how much you know. You know, we know so little, Doctor, about what's under our feet. I know there's dirt, and then you dig down for a while, and you get to water that you can drink if you're lucky. But I don't know much about the Earth. <sighs> Period. I don't know much about the Earth. It, what's in the middle of the Earth? What's... Next to that, what's, it's a lot of territory to cover. Uh, how much does man really know about what he stands on? Well, let me preface it by saying Earth is one of my favorite planets. Oh, mine too. It's, uh, it certainly is on my list of favorite planets. Um, but, but you hit it on the head. We know much less about the inside of the interior of the Earth than we do about the surface of Mars. Uh -huh. Or even, or even on the interior of the Sun. We, we know a surprisingly great detail of what's happening inside the sun. Uh, the other thing is, the most geologically active part of planet Earth is not on the surface. It's thousands of miles beneath our feet. Mm. The Earth is like an onion. There's a, there's a core, and that's mostly made out of iron and nickel. There's an inner core that's solid, an outer core that's liquid. And then, as you learn in grade school, the mantle... That's made out of out of a, 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 what we call just a, 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 a rocky material, and actually the most geologically active part, that is where where most of the chemical changes are occurring, are actually between the core and the mantle. Hmm. It's not on the surface. And what's going on between the core and the mantle? Well, it's the chemistry. Uh, the core right there is lit is very hot liquid. Iron nickel. Do we really mantle. we really know all this for sure? I mean, oh, I, iron oh, yes. and then okay. There, there's um, it, it's clear that for, for a variety of reasons, um, we not only know it's iron and nickel, we also know it has a very small amount of sulfur in it, hmm. and um, it escapes me what else. But but we're, we're very sure it's iron and nickel. Okay, well it's not because we've been there because we haven't. So it must be instrumentation or. Magnetic measurements or what? Yes, it's a combination. It's the magnetic field. It's uh, on the, the passage of the seismic waves. It's the uh, in laboratories people put various things together like iron nickel mm -hmm. and they bring them to very high pressure 
and they and they see well, when is it going to melt, what, what minerals are formed, what's the seismic velocity, right. and it's pretty much clear that the that the core of the Earth is almost entirely iron nickel. Absolutely fascinating stuff. Hold tight. We'll go ahead and get this out of the way. This break. Uh, Dr. Dvorak is my guest, and we're going to be talking of some really fascinating stuff. Already done it, but I'm telling you, there's a lot coming up. Yeah, what's down there? Center of the Earth, right? As always, we'll return to Midnight in the Desert in just a moment. Bell's Midnight in the Desert from July 30th, 2015 with John Dvorak. Topic of Life Beyond Earth. We'll resume in just a moment. In the desert, to call the show, if you're east of midnight, call 1-952-CALL-ART. If you're west of midnight, call 1-952-225-5278. <laughs> Thank you, Ross. Welcome back, everybody. Dr. Dvorak is my guest. We're talking about earthquakes and volcanoes and soon more. There was recently, you know, I really should pay attention, I guess, to the people sending me all these uh, these questions. People live, of course, all over the place. Here's somebody from Miami who says, Art, right, what are the chances of that volcano in the Canary Islands off Africa erupting? I read that half the mountain might fall into the Atlantic. I remember this story and wipe out the East Coast and the Caribbean. Doctor? Well, that is possible. It's an active volcano out there in the Canary Islands. And part of the evolution of those volcanoes, the same as here in Hawaii, is that part of them eventually slide into the ocean, and that creates a huge wave. Mm. Such things occur over a period of, of 10,000 years, 100,000 years, and so the, the probability of it happening is very low, but it is possible. Okay, good. Well, every now and then you get those articles in the paper, and it just, you know, scares the heck out of you, and an island about to or a, a whole part of a mountain about to fall in the water, something that would destroy perhaps the East Coast, or so it's barely possible. But that's right. It's 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 a very small risk. Okay. Um, if you were to be talking to the people in California right now, up and down the San Andreas, would you tell them, relax, enjoy life, or would you say, hey, you know, if I lived there, I'd move? Well, of course you wouldn't. I would say relax, enjoy life. You live in one of the nicest places in the world. There's so much diversity. There's so much excitement. There's so much culture there. It's it's one of my favorite places. High San Francisco, high, yeah. Los Angeles. I was going to say high taxes, though. Um, the taxes are high. <laughs> yes, They're not as high as in many parts yes. of the world. The taxes are high. but But the state just intrigues me. All right, we just had this amazing, amazing, truly amazing thing happen uh, as we got photographs of Pluto. Now, oh, oh yes, spectacular. Yes, in those photographs were 11,000-foot mountains. Now, you know, it's cold out there. It's far from the sun. How do you imagine, can you imagine, how those 11,000-foot mountains got there? 
uh, no, I, I was blown away. <laughs> so was I. That this is not at all what I thought Pluto was going to be. Right. I, I look at those, and I'm, I'm just struck by them. Um, to put this in perspective, Pluto is about half the size of the moon. So it's not a very big object. Right. And it's extremely cold and dark out there. Yes, it is. And so to come upon this thing with so much geologic activity, yeah. is, it just blew us away. I thought it, we'd get a billiard ball and a frozen one at that. that I, I agree with that, Dad, and it'd have, it'd have a bunch of craters on it. And we'd fly by, and people would say, what was the big deal? It's just, that's all it is. But, but it's a very uh, 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 dynamic place. And if it has those 11,000-foot mountains, glaciers made out of nitrogen, it, it is possible that it has a, an internal inter inter ocean of water. Mm -hmm. And, of course, as people say, wherever there's water, there could be life out there. That's right. I, I was watching really the, intriguing. Yes, I was watching the NASA news conference, and some reporter in the back of the uh, room said, you know... I don't see what the big deal is. I'm, we have got these pictures. It's not very exciting. And the scientists looked at him on the panel like he was from another planet, literally. <laughs> but he yes. said, oh, my God, of course it's exciting. Look at this geology. It was it was completely unexpected. I, I don't know of anyone, and, and I was in that, who, 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 who would have thought that this was Pluto. I, I really thought it was just going to be... A, a big bar part of ice with some craters on it, right. and uh, and the surface would be billions of years old. But it's 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 an active surface, which means the internal part of it's active, which means what's the source of the heat? Yes, sir. Right, this geology, A, B, C, just like that. You get to what's the source of the heat, and I guess you could guess radiation, possibly, or I really yes, don't know. But I, everything I, which we which we would put in w will not work. Oh, um, it's because oh. it's a small object, and um, and it just shouldn't have that, that much heat in it, even the radioactive stuff. So in other words, even if you model it, you don't come up with an answer. You just don't come up with an answer. We, 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 we are missing something fundamental here, and Pluto is going to point us in a, in a brand new direction. Fundamental. Interesting. So that whatever it is might change our whole view of planetary science? That's right. And what's out there? Remember, Pluto is just one of maybe uh, 10,000, 100,000 objects like that out there. Um, mm -hmm. And so what are those things like? Yes, indeed. Um, okay, that's just and, and in terms of, well, this looks boring to me, no. these... These, are, well, I mean, I mean, what, what the person said, oh. said at the news conference, yeah. this, this always goes back to that, that same fundamental question. Are we alone? Um, what was our origin? And so forth. When you look at a brand new world, that's still part of our history. Well, then this added more questions than it did answers, right? Oh, certainly. I mean, it, it added a lot of questions. So, you know, you kind of explained the d dynamics going on below our feet, but there may be some stuff we don't fully grasp yet. Oh, there are many things. We're, there are many things which we don't understand, many things that are inconsistent that huh. we're, we're, we're desperately trying to figure out. Okay. Um, one other area that I, I want to get to, be, you know, we're going to eventually take calls here. But you are a scientist, and God, I love science. I absolutely love science. Um, I understand that I can talk to you if I wish about the multiverse or the multiverse um, theory. Can we? Talk oh, sure. It'll you know? be the big discovery of the 21st century. You think? Uh, yes, and we're right on the edge of it. We and we we may have collected data, and 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 the and the the telescope that I work at. I may have had observers which have collected data and they're desperately working through it and trying to, to convince people that, yes, the multiverse is out there. It's, it's not mainstream science. It's not widely accepted. But people are, are very 
are strongly going toward that. Um, you work with a large, a large telescope, as you just yes. mentioned. Um, so I'm, I've got to ask, on behalf of a lot of people out there, have you ever seen anything that just caused you to jump? I mean, something so weird or strange that you might not even talk about it normally? Oh, no, I, I'm happy to talk about anything. Really? But but what makes me jump, as my father says, does not make a person who, who who's normal jump. So I'm intrigued by different things. Yes, I think we've already established that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well... One of the most spectacular things we saw was the breakup of a comet. The comet started to break up into about 20 pieces one night, and I was floored by that. I remember watching a storm over a period of about a week develop and, and dissipate on the planet Neptune. I was really intrigued by that. Wow. Um, we, we, we saw a, a star flare up in a in a in a in a nursery with the with stars are being born. We saw one flare up one night. And of course we, we look at like in the Andromeda galaxy and we're able to see clusters of stars um that sit there. And and we and though we haven't seen it, we we certainly have a lot of evidence of the of the gigantic black hole that sits right at, at the heart of the Milky Way. I worry a bit about black holes. Well why? Well, uh, because if we run into one or one runs into us, um, I, I don't know, it'd be a bad day. You won't even know what happened. Well, there is that, but, um, it, well, there is that. If, if, if you fell into a black hole, you, you wouldn't even know what happened to you. Mm -hmm. But you'd still be gone, or in, an, in, in another universe, possibly. Um, yes. <laughs> um, people aren't quite sure what happens once you get down at the at the point, but in terms of 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 uh, being able to to sense things or to see things, mm -hmm. you you would just sort of age in a in a normal manner. Um, however, people who are looking at you from outside the black hole would see you see 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 you gone. Wow! And so you really wouldn't wouldn't know. What's, what's going on here? So you might actually not in, in I guess in the physical sense you would die, right? You, you would die. Oh, well, yes. I mean, our bodies are, are atoms. And that's what happens to atoms. They, they break up and transmute and so forth. All right. Hold it right there, Doctor. We'll be right back. We'll return in just a moment to midnight. In the Desert with John Dvorak and Art Bell. But first... For Dark Matter News, I'm Leo Ashcraft. A minor earthquake has struck off the northern tip of Vancouver Island. Natural Resources Canada says a 4.7 magnitude quake hit around 5.30 on Wednesday evening. The shock originated about 175 kilometers west of Port Hardy, British Columbia. Natural Resources Canada said there were no reports of damage and that none would have been expected. The ministry said the quake was not felt. According to a new study, Washington, D.C. is slowly seeping into the earth, and it could sink another six inches in the next century due to subsurface land movement under the Chesapeake Bay. The research confirms twin hypotheses, both of which are worrying. The first is the tide gauges show sea level rises in the Chesapeake region are twice the global average, and that levels are rising faster than elsewhere in the East Coast. The second is that the prehistoric ice sheets in the north, which pushed up the land around D.C., are now melting, and the land in the Chesapeake region is settling back down as a result. Researchers at the University of Vermont said the sinking land under the nation's capital would exacerbate the effects of flooding caused by climate change and rising ocean waters. This would in turn threaten the region's roads, monuments, wildlife refuges, and military installations. 
There are numerous reports of people who saw a different-looking aircraft in the sky last night. Many from the Denver, Colorado area say they saw a stealth bomber flying over Dick's Sporting Goods in Commerce City. This was just ahead of the MLS All-Star Game, and that's the aircraft they saw, which means it wasn't so stealth. It made an appearance right after the National Anthem around 7.15 that evening. Quite a few local area residents caught the stealth bomber on video and photographs. You can take a look at them at darkmatternews.com. A mystery over a group picture. Everyone was having a good time until they noticed that they were being photobombed by a ghost. Nothing out of the ordinary seemed to be going on when the photos were taken. But when they took a closer look, that's when they said they noticed a shadowy figure peering out of them from the second-story window. Natasha Oliver and her friends were hanging out in her hometown of Wim in Shropshire, UK. Oliver told ABC News that she truly believes there is a ghost woman and her baby in that window. She and her friends freaked out after they saw the photo on her digital camera back in 2010, taken when they were hanging out on the front lawn of the unfinished home still being built at the time. Oliver said, when we saw the ghostly figure, the boys climbed up the scaffolding to see what was up there, thinking maybe someone was watching. But there was nothing up there. There were no floorboards or anything. Though the photo was taken almost five years ago, Oliver said it recently got widespread attention after she commented on a Facebook post about a fake ghost picture. Though some on social media believe Oliver's photo could be photoshopped, she insisted it wasn't and added she hopes to get in touch with professional photo analysts and paranormal experts to solve the mystery of the ghost in the window. The town of Wynn, where the picture was taken, previously made headlines about reported paranormal activity in 1995 when a photographer claimed he captured an image of a little girl's ghost at the ruins of the town hall that was ravaged by a fire in 1677. Oliver concludes by saying, I didn't believe in ghosts before, but I do now. Actually, I've converted. Fake or real? Take a look at the photos yourself and let us know what you think. Darkmatternews.com and with that, I'm Leo Ashcraft for Dark Matter News. And again, we'll return to our bell in just a moment. free download, right? Put Skype on. And then uh, if you're in North America, America or Canada, simply make out like you're going to call us, like you're going to make us into a contact and put, and put in MITD51. MITD51. Midnight in the Desert 51. You don't have to spell it out, just the initials MITD51. And then it'll be on your contact list and you can just press it and call us. And the same thing goes for those of you in other parts of the world. Uh, we've got an overseas Skype setup, which is really cool. And um, you would just put in MITD55, right in the desert, MITD55. And then you could call us at will. And then, of course, the public number 
which is not a single line, folks. It's many, many lines. The public number is area code 952-225-5278. 952-225-5278. Back now to Dr. Borick. Uh, doctor, welcome back. Uh, yes. Um, let's stay with the multiverse for a moment. Um, how might we actually find the evidence that you know, really says, yes, there are multiple universes. Well, that's actually a different question from the multiverse. Well, multiverse. Uh, yes. On the, or, 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 yes. Um, there was actually a report a few months ago of a discovery. And to put it in the scientific terms, it was a pattern in the B modes of the polarization of the magnetic field on the cosmic background radiation. What that means is that astronomers were able to see the edge of the universe, and that's radiation called the, called the, the uh, a CMB, the Cosmic Microwave Background. Okay. And these people said what they saw were patterns on it. And if there are patterns on it, hmm. then there's something larger than the visible universe that produced those patterns. However, as they looked at more data from other researchers, from other satellites, it was decided this was actually dust in in the intergalactic region. And mm. so all that fell apart. Oh. Well, you had and, me going, and then you crushed me. <laughs> and, but it was intriguing. Now, I mentioned at my observatory, I've had a group of observers there. You, you've certainly heard of dark energy and dark matter. Oh, my goodness, yes. Well, these people have started what is called dark flow, that there's a general flow to the visible universe. And let me illustrate this with an analogy. Okay. If you were, in a, if you were floating in a swimming pool, and no matter where you were in the swimming pool, there's always a current going from one edge to another. Right. You would conclude there's something outside the swimming pool producing this current. Probably. Okay. Be because this current is always pulling you from one side of the pool to the other. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, there's, there's got to be something outside the pool. So what these people look at are large clusters of galaxies. And they, they claim that large clusters of galaxies, they're all moving in the same direction. And the only way for that coherent motion to happen is that there must be matter, gravitational matter, outside the visible universe pulling it. Now, this is very much on the edge. Nobody has come up with any supportive evidence. This is a very minority view, but things like this can certainly change in very short time. So that's a possible way. You might be hearing more about this concept of dark flow. Hmm. Also, have, have you talked much about in, 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 in inflation theory in astronomy? About well, that's the where every, everything's going away from everything, right? Uh, that's right. But there was this burst of inflation very early on in the history. This was an idea that was first developed by Alan Guth at MIT. Um, it has a lot of very attractive, it explains a lot of things in the universe, but if this inflation theory is correct, um, then there, there has to be a, a, a multiverse out there. Um, well, there, I imagine... There isn't any, uh, any I alternative imagine, here. Yeah, I imagine, people people are sorry. desperately trying to figure out if inflation theory is correct or not, and so far it's passed every test, but it's not definitive yet. And I know I'm wrong, but somehow I imagine rapid uh, inflation occurring as a result of a big bang. Well, the big bang comes after. Really? Uh, yeah. What, what what you and I know as the big bang is sort of the, the, the coasting that goes on after inflation. Mm -hmm. um, exactly what powers inflation isn't clear either, because we're getting down to where general relativity and quantum physics have to meet. And we still don't, don't understand what those, the way to put those together. As, as Brian Green at Columbia University has said many times, 
Um, the physicists have been playing a con game to everybody <laughs> for a hundred years. Really? We have this theory called general relativity that explains things in a very intense gravitational field and on large scale. And then we have quantum physics that explain things on a very small atomic scale. But those two things are incompatible. Those are inconsistent. It's like we have two theories of the universe, and the universe should have only one theory. There should just be one fundamental. And in, until we, we can marry these things together, we, we are going to have these difficulties. Um, I'm going to give you a chance to try and explain something to me that I, I ask most people of your caliber. Um, quantum physics is fascinating to me, and uh, quantum entanglement. Oh, yeah. Boy, I'm having such a hard time with that. It, you know, I'm, I'm a ham operator. I understand communications, but I don't understand how two things can act in unison no matter how far they're separated without a form of communication that we don't begin to understand. You're exactly right. Mm. It, Einstein called it spooky action at a distance. It's spooky, all right. It's, uh, um, it's not at all intuitive, but it's the way the universe works. <laughs> and and to put it on a fundamental level, we we now live in a in a in a world with cell phones and uh, 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 Xerox machines and computers, right? Yes. All of that came out of quantum physics. Right. We are now into what is known as entanglement physics, <laughs> and so the technology of the 21st century, people say, is going to come out of entanglement. And exactly what's going to come out is, of course, very intriguing. Huh. Um, to say the, the least, I mean, you're being built is the quantum computer. Right. And if the quantum computer, if you can actually build it, it means there are parallel universes out there. That's the only way to explain the way a quantum computer works. Doctor, does that mean if we could build one, we could talk to another or perhaps communicate with another universe? Well, we're not sure. We're not sure <laughs> right. how communication right. goes across that. Right. Or whether, what the effect is. Um, on the electromagnetic radiation, which everyone knows is light, might not go across, but gravity would go across. And this is why people are searching for waves in the gravity field. These would go across other dimensions, the multiverse, and so forth. And so far, all we have is circumstantial evidence for the existence of gravity waves. If we ever get concrete evidence, that's a game changer. Teleportation is a reality now. But it's only on the atomic level. Huh. And people are trying to, to see, can you actually teleport something that is macroscopic? Nobody has done it, but... But that's where 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 yeah. where the edge of that part of science is. So and that of course changes everything in terms of of our of our culture, our technology, and so forth. So right now, uh, quantum entanglement, in terms of trying to get an ex explanation for it, we might as well call it magic. That's how much it we looks, understand. It looks like magic. Yeah. Um, because it's not intuitive to us. But remember, we live in a universe that is low energy and is cold. Mm -hmm. And much of the multiverse is probably not like that. There's reason to think that, that because of the Big Bang, the part of the multiverse that we grew out of got cold and, and very low energy density. That's, that's, that, that's what we see out there at night. But most of the multiverse is probably not that. In fact, there's probably not neither time nor space in most of the of the of the multiverse. Time and space is sort of an illusion that we see because it's cold and dark around here and low energy. Huh. We understand so little about ourselves at these levels. My goodness. That's right. And it comes down to the same questions people have been asking. Where am I in the universe? Am I alone out here? Where did all this stuff come from? We're, we're still trying to answer those basic questions. As a man of science, when confronted with religious um, faith, 
conviction. How do you find yourself coming down? Well, whenever I teach a class, I almost always begin by asking my students to tell me something that's true. I come up with the question, how do you know something is true? And the punchline is, there are different ways of coming to truth. There's, there, is, there are various rules that we use in science. There are various rules that we use in the court system um, to find out if somebody's guilty or not. Right. There's faith. And people, these are different components of culture that people, people are using different rules to figure out what is true and what is not. And as you grow old, what, what, what you accept will actually shift around. Okay. So people with faith, I respect them a great deal. Um, it's only when people speak things that are inconsistent or dogmatic to me that it really, it really rubs me raw. But I, I certainly respect there are different ways of pursuing truth. Sure. Sure there are. Um, and there's, uh, it, it's interesting, actually, that the current pope seems to be kind of uh, moving religion perhaps more toward science, ever so small steps at a time. And, and science sometimes moves toward, in, you know, the theory of how it all began. Not in seven days, but... But nobody knows. I mean, there is that instant, one second before the Big Bang, we have no idea what happened, right? Or do we? Well, that, well that's, that's right. We have to, I forget what it is, we go down to 10 to the minus 20 <laughs> seconds, and we know the physics to that point, but not before. Um, one, one thing that has to be said is that as you establish truth in science, that has changed over time. What was a considered a way of getting scientific truth 100 years ago is not the way that, that scientific truth is established today. So science, the way we do it, and the way we accept um, research and truth has changed over time. All right, and one, so there hasn't been any absolute in science. One more question, then I've, I've probably got to go to the phones, but um, how close do you think we are to building a quantum computer? I know they're fooling around with the very basics of it right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm very confused about the quantum computer and, and what it's going to take. Um, some people have claimed that they have built one, but most people will say, no, that's, that, that's not it. That, they're, that's, that's not producing um, what's expected of a quantum computer. Um, I'm not sure how close. I'm, I'm sitting on the edge of my seat reading Nature and Science magazine and seeing if somebody... Somebody actually does it. I'm not it's even, going I'm, to change everything. Remember, a quantum computer makes most of our life obsolete because now your credit card is not secure anymore. All, all that security is gone. Right. All the military security is gone, which is why the Pentagon is extremely interested in seeing whether a quantum computer can be built or not. I'm worried about Windows 10. You know, <laughs> which I, I don't know. Right? I've always been a Mac guy myself. <laughs> yes. Um, very quickly, I think we might have Sandra. Yes. Uh, hi, Sandra. On uh, Skype, you're on the air. Hi there. I live in San Francisco, and ah. um, I've, I'm loving your show right now because I, we're almost at a year from ago, a year ago in South Napa, there was a 6.0 earthquake, and that really scared me. And it wasn't, you know, so big in San Francisco, but just how it knocked that city down. And I don't think the Bay Area, there's just so many new people living here. I want your guests to say, like, how many days we really should be prepared, because I'm a member of the Neighborhood Emergency Response Team, and they say 72 hours, but I think it's really five days. If it was um, a big one, Doctor, how long should she prepare for? I would say be, be, be prepared to, to be independent of any support for five days. Hmm. Have enough water and food and so forth. And don't expect any communication or any help. And, but after five days, um, hopefully people, people are, will get to you. Well, we're trained to be self-sufficient in the NERIC program, and we're also trained to go into buildings 
when we're ready to just start finding people and help evacuate people. But it's it's a scary thing to think that it could be bigger than 6.0. So thank right. you. Yeah. Thank you. Am I still there? Uh, you're you're there. She's not. Uh, she had, uh, she hung up because something big was a truck or something was <laughs> coming toward her. Okay. What I want to tell her, and this is something that we we spend a lot of time um, thrashing about. If there's an earthquake, like the magnitude six at Napa, right, the probability of a larger one in 72 hours goes way up. And so, if there has been Saw some destruction, and you are going to start rescuing people. Be aware that the ground could start shaking at any moment. Doctor, is there a way to know if an earthquake that you just felt is a precursor and something big is coming, or if it's just a, a one off thing? Don't worry about it. No, the only thing which we can do huh. is give a probability of something happening. For example, the probability of a of, of the World Series earthquake, like the Loma Prieta, right. happening over the next three days is like one out of one out of twenty five thousand or something. Mm -hmm. If you have a Napa earthquake, the probability of a larger one in the next seventy two hours is like one out of twenty. So it goes way up for those next next day or two. Well, and, and people in my People concerned about earthquake hazards and physics of earthquakes make a very strong point to the rescuers. Understand, if you're going into a wrecked building, this thing could collapse on you. Um, that's true. And it seems after earthquakes, people camp out on lawns and stuff like that for exactly that reason. They've seen so many buildings collapse. They just don't want to be inside anything. Right. And it is best if, if you can... Uh, can if it's possible, not to stay in a building during those those hours. It isn't always possible, but but one has to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. And even if you get a magnitude 4 earthquake, uh, for the next couple of hours, you don't want to be standing on a ladder painting your house or in your car <laughs> fixing it. But just do do something else for the next few hours. Uh, that makes sense to me. Ladder is a bad place, definitely. Um, and I'm on and off roofs all the time, putting up antennas, doing that sort of thing, and... Um, right. If you feel an earthquake, don't do that for a few hours. Mm -hmm. um, so when scientists say, uh, uh, don't worry, there's not going to be another one, and they do say that sometimes after an earthquake, I was not a precursor. They don't really know. Well, that, that, that used to be what was said, maybe some 10, 20 years ago. But that's not what is said today. Mm -hmm. All right. Stay right there, doctor. We'll be right back. Dr. Dvorak is my guest. Earthquakes. Volcanoes, quantum theory, <laughs> we're all over the place. Public number is 952-225-5278. Lines are definitely open now. 952-225-5278. And with that, we will leave Art for this evening. We will join him tomorrow for the conclusion. And I'm still kind of like geeking out the fact that I just hit 77th place in the arena. <laughs> Personally, that, mind you, is something that definitely is getting me over here at CMP Central. But with that, we will conclude today's broadcast day. As always, please like, share, and subscribe. Get us to the goal of 50,000 views, 1,000 subscribers. So box you over in Extra Senses, those nice red boxes, so we can send them to you, and YouTube puts us on the algorithms. Coinbase, iBot, and Gain.gg now more streamlined down at the bottom, so they're not filling out three-fourths of a page in the comment. Click on your link, get your freebies, $10 of course free for both Coinbase and Nevada, and your first 100 credits free on Gain.gg. Help yourself and help the show at the same time. Until tomorrow, while well, we continue to rock in Dominion in the final day to get your dolls for the boy here. Again, like, share, and subscribe to kind of one another and release the Kraken as Jorgen's dolls will finish up as we march along here from day one. Have a great night. Enjoy your night's rest. We'll see you tomorrow.